Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. So in today's video, I'll be going through the 2019 physics exam multiple choice section. Like always guys, before I start this video, if you guys want private tutoring in specialist methods, physics or chemistry, uh, you can always email me through this email. And yeah guys, let's smash through this exam. Question one, magnetic and gravitational forces have a variety of properties. Which of the following best describes the attraction repulsion properties of magnetic and gravitational forces? So what do we know? We know magnetic, you know, magnets have both the attractive and repulsion um, properties. And this is why, because you can have, um, for example, if you have a south or, sorry, north pole and a south pole, they will attract. So there is this attraction property. We can also have a repulsion by having both north-north. And so they will repel. And we can also have south-south. They will repel. So magnetics actually both have this repulsion and um, attraction properties. So magnets force, B and C are wrong. Because these are saying only repel and only attract. Done. What about gravitational forces? We know gravitational forces, which is normally masses... Oops, well, like excellent. normally masses, only have attractive forces. It only attracts. And yeah, so A would be the best for that one. Two, the electrical field between two parallel plates that are 1.0 times 10 to the negative 2 part from this, so this is your electrical field strength, which of following is close to the voltage between these two plates. I'm just going to pull up my formula. Um, this is a, just one of the most common kind of questions in an exam, so... Um, going to my formula to use, all right, for parallel plates, the formula that gives me the voltage is V is equal to ED, where E is the electrical field strength and D is the distance between those two plates, and luckily we're given all the information. So V is equal to E, so 2.0 times 10 to the negative 4, and the distance is 1.0 times 10 to the negative 2. Let's put that in our calculator and see what we can go answer. That gives me 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2.0 times 10 to the negative 6, so B to the negative 6, done. Question 3, three charges, these, are placed at a vertices of an isosceles triangle as shown below. Which of the following best uh, represents the direction of the net force on the charge negative Q? Alright, common question. So, think that you're negative Q, right now we're on negative Q. So... Let's have a look at what negative Q, what's going to happen on negative Q when it's with that 2Q. Hmm. Because this is a positive and this is a negative, they're going to attract. So negative Q will actually be attract. Let me actually get a different color. Negative Q would be actually attracted to it. It will be attracted. So that's what's going to happen to that. What about negative Q on that 2, negative 2Q? Well, because they're both negatives, they're going to be repulsed. So repelling. And so this negative Q will actually be repelled this way. Mm -hmm. And so those are the only two uh, forces, and we just need to find a net force. It's very easy to find a net force using these arrows, so you can put this arrow right over here. And so your net force is going to be from here to here, which is um, an arrow going to the left, so A. Hope that makes sense. Nice. All right. Question four. The magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity at Earth's surface is G. Okay, so let's just draw a diagram. So let's say this is... Okay, that's your Earth, so mass, actually, so this is your R, and so at the surface is G, and this is the mass of the Earth. The magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity at Earth's surface is G. Planet Y has twice the mass and half the radius of Earth. Both planets are modeled as uniform spheres. So imagine drawing, all right, for example, a bigger circle, because it has twice the mass, and it's half the radius. Imagine this is going to be r over 2 because it's half the radius of the Earth and it's going to be 2m, double the mass. And we just want to find which of the following best gives the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity on this surface of planet Y. We just want to find the gravitational field strength. Well, okay, let's first look at the first one, this one over here. Well, we know it's G, the gravitational field strength. And, you know, using your formula, G, um, m r squared. Where, of course, this is r capital R squared. Now let's imagine using that formula for this. So we know acceleration due to gravity is A is equal to G, the mass, which is two times the mass. So imagine 2M. So 2M, which we can write as 
2gm over r squared, the radius squared, which is r over 2 squared, which we can write as r squared over 4. And so bringing that to the top, this will be 8. And hence, this will be that. All right. Have a look at this then. A is equal to 8. Take that G over MR squared. What do we know what G MR squared is? It's actually equal to G from this over here. So we can replace that over here. So guess what? The actual um, <laughs> magnitude of like, the G value at the surface of planet Y is actually eight times the G value at the planet of Earth's surface. So D looks like an answer to that one. Nice. Question five. So this goes for question five and six. Let's have a look. A 40 volt RMS AC generator and an ideal transformer. Remember, ideal means that the power on the left side of the transformer and the power on the right hand on the transformer are equal because there's no power lost. I used to supply power. The diagram below shows the generator and the transformer supplying 240 volts to a resistor with a resistance of 1200. So this over here, this resistor gets supplied 240 volts RMS. And that's 40 volts. Great. Which of the following correctly identifies the parts labeled X and Y as and the function of the transformer? Okay, so part X is what? So this is part X. Well, what do we always know? The Le left hand side of the transformer is what? It's the primary coil. Always the left hand side is the primary coil, and the right hand side of the transformer is what we call the secondary coil. Nice and easy. So uh, X will have to be the primary coil, so we can take these out. And part Y is secondary coil. Great. So the function of the transformer, to know the function of this transformer, is it a step down or a step up? It's to have a look at its turns. We can see that we're going from a thousand turns to a six thousand turns. So it's actually a step up because we're stepping up the number or we're stepping up the voltage in this case. We're stepping up the voltage so it's a step up transformer. Nice and easy. So B. Question six. Which of the following is closest to the RMS for current in the primary circuit. So what we want to know is like the current in this part over here. This is your primary. And this is, of course, this is your secondary. So your primary, we want to find the current. So, hmm, guess what? Well, if we find the current on the right-hand side, which is the secondary um, part, which is just going to be what? So we know current is voltage over resistance. And so your voltage is 240 over your resistance, which is this. That's going to give me 240. That's going to give me 0 0.2. So, so I know the current over here is actually 0 0.2. So what I can use here is use my formulas. I know that, remember, this is your secondary uh, current. So I know to get, this is your primary, of course. We want to find our primary current. We know IP is equal to IS, is equal to, well, we can use the voltage or the turns. I'm going to use the turns because they're much, they're right in our faces. So um, we know that it's NS uh, over NP. You should have these forms all in your formula sheets. So we know that to find the primary, um, let's put what we have. So we have, we want to find IP. So the current in the primary server, IS is 0 0.2. Um, the number of calls in the secondary is 6 thousand divided by the number of calls in the primary which is a one thousand which is actually just going to be six so imagine multiplying these two that's going to be actually equal to 1.6 so your so sorry 1.2 what am i saying 1.2 uh amps so your actually primary current is going to have 1.2 amps which looks like the easier answer nice question seven um, let's use a different color. The coil of an AC generator completes 50 revolutions per second. The graph of the output voltage versus time for the generator is shown. Which of the following graphs best represents the output voltage if the rate of rotation is changed to 25 revolutions per second? So what have they, what they've done is they've slowed it down by half the time. So, so sorry, they've slowed it down. And so they've slowed the speed by half. And what do we know? If we slowed something by half, we know it takes t like two times the time it took originally. So your actual period is actually getting twice. And because these are one of the most kind of common, these, these questions are so common in practice exams, they are so easy to become, you know, 
to do great in them. So we know that um, so they slowed down the they've slowed down the rate and hence they've pretty much the time's gonna take twice the amount, so the period is doubled. And so what is the period? Let's think about the period. The period is the time it takes for a full rotation. So if you look over here, this is one full rotation from here to here. And let's say it was originally two. Because now we've doubled the period, it's actually gonna be four over here. So it, for one full rotation, this is how it would look. It would be like this. So now, as you can see, one full rotation takes four. So it takes the whole, pretty much the whole space. Which one looks like that? So A does not look like that and C does not. So well, actually B and D look good because they do have one full rotation. Um, yeah, they've actually doubled that period. Now let's also have a look at something else we need to understand. If we've doubled the time or the period, how does that affect our voltage? Well, we know our EMF is equal to negative N um, change in flux over change in time. Well, because we've doubled our time, so two times, what has happened to our EMF, our voltage? It's actually halved because, you know, that we've doubled the denominator, so it's actually halved. So the voltage, you know how originally it was one? It'll be actually half. So it will look like, so it looks like this. So B is wrong because the voltage is still at one. So D looks perfect. As you can see, the voltage has been halved. Done. Question eight. So ele electrical generator is shown in the diagram below. The generator is turning clockwise. Okay. All right. The voltage between P and Q and the magnetic flux through the loop are both graphed as a function of time with voltage versus time shown as a solid line and the magnetic flux versus shown as dashed line. Which of the following graphs best shows the relationship for this electrical generator? One of the most kind of common questions you'll see in practice exams also. Um, well, we can see that originally the magnetic field lines are actually going to pass through that loop, and hence we're going to have a high maximum flux. We're going to actually get, so if we were drawing, drawing a flux diagram, so magnetic flux diagram over time, we're going to have a maximum flux originally. And as it rotates, of course, that flux is going to go down, and it'll look like a cosine function like that, something like that, and when it returns again. So we'll have this. And the way I actually determine how the voltage is going to look, what does the voltage time graph look like, is by looking at the flux. Have a look. Um, these are called turning points over here. If you don't do methods, so these parts over here are called turning points when they turn. And so these, when you look at the voltage, it's going to, they're all going to be zero. So make them all zero. And so have a look at the slope from here to here. Is it negative or positive? As we can see, it's negative because it's going down but make sure, do the reverse. If it's negative, make it positive. And this is why. We know from the formula, negative N, change in, um, change in flux over change in time, we always have this negative. So here, this means slope, and that negative, we have to multiply by negative. So it give, this slope over here is negative, make it positive. So it's going to be on top. And of, of course, this is positive from here to here, so make it negative, so it's going to get at the bottom. And then it will look like this. So which one... Does that look like? Looks like A is your answer for that one. Nice and easy. With flux, yep, with that and that. Done. I want to also show you a quick, if you do methods, you are in luck because if you do methods, this is one of the most easiest questions to do. Have a think about this. So imagine it's quite easy to draw the flux diagram. So, you know, the flux is all uh, from this kind of question. It's going to start at its maximum and it's going to look like a cosine function. So we can actually make that. A cosine function, so imagine that's your flux and that's your time. So we can write it as flux is equal to cos t. Remember, to get the magnetic field uh, to EMF, it's actually negative n over change in magnetic flux, change in time. This here is your actual derivative, if you don't know. So it's the same as like changing, it's the same as d, d theta over dt. Forget about that n. Imagine it's n is 1. Who cares? But that negative is very important. So if we can find the derivative of d theta, which is just d theta over dt, it's defining the derivative of cos is actually negative sine t. And because we multiply a negative, so now we have d theta dt, which is here, and we multiply by that negative, we get positive sine t. So your actual EMF, your graph of your EMF is going to be a positive sine, which will look like, we know our sine graph looks like this. And yep, that's what A looks like. Beautiful. So normally when I do these questions, I, I just, if you do methods, you are in luck because physics is all maths. And yeah, that's a very quick way to do it. 
Question nine. Let's have a look at that. Um, let's use a different. Okay. A monochromatic light ray passes through the three different media as shown in the diagram below. Okay. So different mediums. Assume that V1 is the speed of the light in medium one, V2 is the speed of light two in medium two, and V3 is the speed of light in medium three. Which of the following would best represents the relative speeds in the mediums? So, okay. Hmm. So they all have different angles. Hmm. So I know the formula to like represent velocity is like that comes to mind is n1 v1 equals n2 v2 and we can see that all of them have a different angle around the um what we call the normal so this one over here will have i don't know it's, you know what i would say to do this question i'll just guess values for example what do i mean well let's look at a relationship that we can create i know that n n1 v1 is equal to that and i also know that n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. Hmm, have a look over here. What am I seeing? I see that n1's here and n1's here. n2 is here and n2 is here. Shouldn't v1 actually then equal to that sine theta and this v2 equal to that sine th um, theta, um, you know, that uh, theta second? Yeah, so you can actually see a relationship. Well, what I'm seeing is actually a relationship, meaning that v1 is actually just equal to sine theta 1. And V2 equals sine theta 2. And hence, V3, which is the medium 3, should also equal to sine theta 3. And that theta is your normal, that, um, the angle of the normal. Wait, I think we have seen a relationship that we can do here. This can actually help us do the question quite quickly. So, if I can draw... If I can start approximating, that's the word. If I can start approximating the angles, for example, I'll say this is 60 angle, the 60 degrees. So in the medium one, so I can write V1 is equal to sine 60, which is, so what's sine 60? So sine 60 is actually uh, 0 0.86. So let's put that here, 0 0.86. V2, which is what? So imagine this is 60. I would approximate this to be like, let's say 30, because it's smaller. So we'll put that um, here, 30 degrees. So V2 is just sine 30 sine 30 that gives me a half so 0 0.5 and v3 let's approximate it here also v3 is very large so we'll put it as 90 oh not 90 no 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 80 80 because 90 is 90 degrees it's a perfect yeah 80 degrees which is sine 80 which is 0 0.98 aha uh -huh. now we actually have some relative speeds and so we can see that the largest is v3 and it's large um the second largest is v1 and the last is v2 so it has to go through v3 v1 v2 which looks like uh d looks like your answer yeah that's how i would have done this question and yeah just having a look at the um getting some angles using the formulas that i can see and yeah creating the relationship what about question 10 Let's have a look at this. The horizontal face of a glass block is covered with a film of liquid as shown below. A monochromatic light ray is incident on that glass liquid boundary with an angle of incidence of 62 degrees. Okay. The minimum value. So minimum means the smallest value of the liquid's refractive index so that some of the light will just cross the interference into the liquid is closest to what? Aha. Uh -huh. What they're asking us is the critical like the critical angle where the critical angle is. For example, so this, of course, is your normal. This part is your normal. Let me draw that nicely. So this here is your normal. Actually, let me bring this here. This part is your normal. So if this line goes over here, of course, it's your incident angle. The, crit the most minimum, so the smallest value that the refractive index, so that some of the light would just pass through that liquid is actually going to be your what we call your critical angle, where this, as you can see, is this is the smallest um, value. Then after that, there's gonna it's gonna go past through that liquid. So this is the smallest value. So it's actually what they're saying is, what is the value of the refractive index of the liquid, where some of the light will cross the interference of the liquid? Yeah, we just have to use the um, critical angle formula. So we know that n one sine theta c, which is your so sine theta 1 in this case is equal to N2. N2 is, of course, the liquid, the refractive index. So it's just going to be N1, which is 1.75 sine 
62 degrees. That's going to be your N2. Done. Seven five sine sixty two, which is one point five, which is approximately B. So choose B as your answer. Done. Question eleven: An ultralight aeroplane aeroplane of mass five hundred kilograms flies in the horizontal straight line at a constant speed of a hundred meters per second. Look at that word, constant speed. What do we know about constant speed? We know that f net. It's always going to be equal to zero, and also acceleration is always equal to zero when it's always constant speed. If, it, if you ever, any time, hear constant velocity, constant speed, it means F net, so the net force is zero and acceleration is zero. The horizontal resistance force acting on the aeroplane is 1,500. Which of the following best describes the magnitude of the forward horizontal thrust of the aeroplane? So let's just draw an airplane. So imagine this box is the aeroplane. Something like that. And so, we, of course, we have some thrust that's pushing it forward. We call it T. And we have some resistance force because of air, air resistance, you know, uh, which we'll call, where well, they tell us it's 1,500. Done. So, what's the net force? We know F net is going to be the total sum of these forces because it's going to be moving to the right. Remember, the thrust is going to be pushing. It's going to be hot. Yeah. It's going to be pushing the plane forward. Um, so, we're going to take the right as positive. So, we're going to write T minus 1,500. And so what's your net force? We know our net force is zero from this. So we can put that zero in here. And hence your thrust is just 1,500. So choose A. Nice and easy. Question two. Uh, a small ball is rolling at a constant speed. So it's moving at a constant speed. Uh, along a horizontal table, it rolls off the edge of the table and follows this parabolic path shown in the diagram below. Ignore air resistance. Okay. Which of the following statements about the motion of the ball as it falls is correct? So the ball speed increases at a constant rate. Um, hmm. So what do I know? So let's just, I would say, is it moving at a constant rate? Let's try to calculate that. We'll start making some values up. So imagine this ball's going to the right at 20 meters per second. Now, of course, that's your horizontal velocity. And the horizontal velocity is always constant. That's what we know. It's always going to be constant in the horizontal direction. But what we're going to also have is we're going to have some vertical um, speed. Um, initially, of course, u is equal to zero because um, in the vertical direction because there's no vertical uh, velocity. But as, it, as, the fall, as the ball goes down, of course, there is going to be some uh, vertical velocity. And we want to calculate the sum of those velocities to get the total speed. What I think of doing is, okay, hmm. we know that the ball, well, we know, of course, um, that the horizontal velocity is always 20 meters per second. We want to calculate the vertical velocity. So, I know that initially the vertical velocity is u equals zero. A is equal to negative 9.8. Remember acceleration in the vertical direction is always negative 9.8. Um, what else do I know? What else can we do? So u, this, um, we, you, um, and we want to find the velocity. Wait, wait, we want to find the velocity. We want to find the velocity. And we actually make up some times. It actually makes, make, so imagine at T1's over here. So at T1, let's say at T1. So we want to calculate the velocity at T1. So V is equal to U plus AT. So V is U, we'll use that. So it's just going to be actually negative 9.8 meters per second. So the velocity is going to be negative 9.8. So it's just 9.8 meters per second. So at T equals 1, it's going to be um, 9.8. But remember, you need to be careful here. We're trying to calculate the speed of the ball. Because remember, this is the only vertical speed. So to get the actual speed, what we're going to need to do is we're going to... Okay, so that horizontal speed's going like this. We also... Which is 20 meters per second. And we also have the vertical, which is... Um, going like this in this case. We'll just make it 9.8. We just need the numbers. We don't care about direction. So it's just going to be a... Uh, what we call a... Um, Pythagoras theorem formula. So we know to get that overall speed, it's just 9.8 squared over 20 squared. And that's going to give us our velocity, our actual real velocity. 
So it's gonna be, sorry, I didn't write that properly. So 10 squared there. So 22.3. So at T1, at T1, your speed, your actual speed is actually 22.3 meters per second. Let's actually calculate at t equals 2 also. And it's very easy now because you're using the same formula, but now at t2. So it's just going to be um, v equals a times t, which is, um, what's 9.8 times 2? It's actually 19, uh, negative 19.6, but forget about that negative. Who cares about that negative? So it's just 19.6. And imagine subbing it back into this formula. So taking this out here and writing 19.6. And then using the, f again, using the same formula. So... 19.6, so square root 19.6 squared plus 20 squared. That's going to give me, actually, so at t equals 2, the velocity is equal to 28 meters per second. Okay, we'll do one more. I want Because I want to see the actual pattern. Is the rate increasing? And also, so at t equals 3, so it means that it's going to be 9.8 times 3, so it's going to be then... 29.4 so we're going to put here 29.4 of course i'm putting 29.4 in here too so 20 squared and that's going to give me 35 okay Okay, 36 around meters per second. Let's look at the rate. Let's look at the difference between these velocities. Are they actually increasing at a constant rate? If they are increasing at a constant rate, A is right. So let's look at the difference between these, um, at these two speeds here. So what's, uh, let's say, 28 minus 22.3. The difference is 5.7. So if it's, it's actually increased by 5.7, these two. Let's see how much these two increased. So from... 35.5 minus 28, 7.5. These two have increased by, no, it's not increasing at a constant rate. It's increasing by some different rates. So rubbish, that's wrong. A is wrong. I hope that kind of does how, how I did those calculations, show you how, yeah, to have a think about that. B, the momentum of the ball is conserved. Rubbish. Why? Well, momentum is only conserved when there are no external forces in the system. In this case, there are actual external forces, and that's the weight force. As the ball falls down, there's going to be a weight force pushing it down due to acceleration, of course, 9.8. So there is external forces, and so there is no conservation of momentum in this case. Remember, always remember, momentum is only conserved when there is no external forces. Done. So B is rubbish. C, the acceleration of the ball is constant. Hmm, let's look at this. Why? Well, we know in the horizontal, like horizontal, there's no acceleration. Acceleration is zero, of course. But remember, the uh, vertical ex um, you know, acceleration is always 9.8, negative 9.8. Everywhere. It's always constant. So that's not wrong. C looks great, actually. So C looks very correct, to be honest. And so, of course, yeah. What about D? The ball travels at a constant speed. Garbage, garbage. We calculated the speeds. They are all not the same. They're not moving at a constant velocity. Look at the speeds. They, they're not all the same. They have to be the same if it's moving at constant speed. So that's also wrong. So C is your right answer. Done. Question 13. Joanna is an observer in spaceship A. Watching spaceship B fly at a relative speed of this. Um, okay, so we're given, beautifully, we're given our uh, Lawrence factor. She measures the length of the spaceship B from her frame of reference to be 150. Which of the following is closest to the proper time, proper length of space, spaceship B? Easy. So we know length is equal to the, your actual length, your is equal to the proper time over your uh, Lorentz factor. In this case, we know our length is 150, and we want to calculate our proper length over your Lorentz factor, which is three. So it's just going to be 150 times three, which is 450, done, nice and easy. Yeah, Does that, is there any, is that it? Join this person this Um, She measures the length of, yes, so she measures the length of space from her frame of reference, yes, and yes, because if she's looking at it, if spaceship as from spaceship A's frame of reference, she's going to see this going through um length contraction, of course, and yeah, so L, yes, that's L, which is 150, beautiful, that's good. 
Electrons of mass 9.1 times 10, so of course, the mass of an electron, are accelerated in an electron gun at a speed of this. The best estimate for the de Broglie wavelength of these electrons is what? <laughs> these are nice and easy. So just, I'm gonna bring back my formulas. All right, so for wavelength, to calculate the wavelength, de Broglie wavelength is equal to H over P, which is momentum. Momentums are just M times V, mass times velocity which, yeah, we have the mass and the velocity, and we know H is 6.3, you know, it's Planck's constant. So it's just going to be 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 all over the mass, which is, let me put that nicely, the mass, which is 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31, and 1.0 times 10 to the power of 7. Done. So putting all this in your calculator, that gives you... One point zero times ten to the power of seven. That gives me seven point two eight times ten to the negative eleven, which looks like C is your answer. Done. Question fifteen. Electrons pass through a fine metal grid, forming a diffraction pattern. If the speed of the electrons were doubled using the same metal grid, what would be the effect of the fringe spacing? Um, all right. So let's actually draw a diagram. Okay, that's not nice. To, uh, uh, yeah. So wait. Yep. So imagine this is your fringe spacing. Of course, there's going to be a diffraction pattern. Wait, this is going to be equal. Oh my god, it's actually ugly. Um, something like that. And imagine these are your actual. Yep. So imagine this is your diffraction grading. So a diffraction pattern. We know our space, uh, our fringe spacing is actually just your wavelength, where these over here are your fringe spacing. So we've doubled the speed. We've doubled the speed, and what would that affect? So what would that have effect on the wavelength? Guess what? Isn't it using this formula over here? So we know that H, so your lambda, your wavelength, which is your space, um, sorry, your fringe spacing is equal to H over mv. If we've doubled the speed, it means that 2mv now. We've actually halved the wavelength, meaning that we've halved the space graphic. So the space spacing would actually decrease because we've halved it. So B looks great. Is that A? The fringe spacing cannot be determined. Yeah, no, yeah, B looks good. Question 16. Let's have a look at this. Um, students are conducting a photoelectrical effect experiment. They shine light of known frequency onto metal and measure the maximum kinetic energy of emitted photoelectrodes. What do we know? When you change the frequency, it only has effect on the maximum kinetic energy, not other stuff. Only kinetic energy. Uh, the students increase the intensity of the incident light. What do we know when you increase the intensity? It will only increase the number of photoelectrons. Uh, yeah, so it would not... It doesn't have any effect on kinetic energy. Be careful of that. It just only affects the um, number of photoelectrons. The effects of increasing the the effect of this increase would most likely be what? So we've increased the intensity. What do we say? Okay, nothing. A and B are wrong. Why? Because there's as you can see, they're saying lower maximum kinetic. It, remember intensity. When you increase the intensity, it's only going to increase the photoelectrons. It's not good. It's not going to. It's, it does not have any effect on the kinetic energy. So those are wrong. C, fewer emitted photoelectrons but higher maximum. Still look at this. It says it still affects the kinetic energy. Wrong. And also when they're saying fewer emitted electrons, that's rubbish. When you increase the intensity, you actually, there's more emitted electrons, photoelectrons. So D, more emitted photoelectrons but the same maximum kinetic energy. Beautiful. 17, whichever following is a true when incandescent light is compared to laser light. Okay, laser light has a very wide spectrum. No, laser light actually has a very narrow spectrum. It, it's like, you know, yeah, whereas incandescent light actually has a wide spectrum. So A is wrong because, yeah, they're saying narrow spectrum for incandescent and laser. Both laser light and incandescent, incandescent light have a very narrow spectrum. No, only laser light has a narrow spectrum, but incandescent actually has a very wide. C, laser light is incoherent. Incandescent light is coherent. <laughs> it's just the opposite. No, laser light is coherent and incandescent light is incoherent. D, laser light is coherent, beautiful, and incandescent light is incoherent. Beautiful. Let's have a look at this. from. So it's, this is for 18 and 19. As part of an experimental investigation, physics students use a pendulum, as shown below, in to di indirectly measure the magnitude of the Earth's gravitational field at their location. All right. The students use a constant mass and a constant amplitude of the swing, changing only the length of time. So sorry, changing the length of the pendulum and then measuring the time for the five for five oscillations. They obtain four different time readings of four different lengths of pendulums. Okay. 
All right. By using this, um, the relation, but, but sorry, by using the relationship with T is the period and F is the length of the pendulum, the students obtain four values for the magnitude of the Earth's gravitational field. Which of the following best identifies the independent, dependent, and control variable in the student's experiment? Easy. So whenever you're given a formula like this, this is your key here. We know, like, for example, Y equals MX plus C. I always tell students, I always tell 100% all my students, this is the key here. Think of when you get an equation, it's so easy to identify the independent, dependent variables. The dependent variable is always your Y value. It's always where your um. It's your vertical axis. When you draw something, it's your vertical axis. It's your y value. So, and x is your independent. So, independent uh, variable, and this is your dependent variable. Because um, what you do is your independent variable is the thing that you change. And it's, in this case, what they were changing is the length of the pendulum, the length of the pendulum. And what does that do? It affects the time, the period of oscillations. So, done. So, we know for a fact that because we're changing the length, that's going to be your independent variable, and this is going to, it's going to be your dependent variable, because that's get that's what gets affected. Um, yeah. So, hmm. So your dependent variable is going to be your time. So, those are wrong. That's wrong. So, and your independent variable is going to be your length, because that's what we changed. So, C is wrong. A looks good. Done. Yeah. Question 19. Uh, which of the following best explains why students measure the time for the five oscillations rather than the time for one oscillation? This is very important. Why do they measure more? It's because what they will normally do is they, this will reduce random error, reduce random error, but not um, systematic error, of course, but it will only reduce random error because what they do is when they get five, they actually average them and that just kind of reduces those random errors. Um, Let's have a look at A. One oscillation is too quick to see. What the hell? That's rubbish. That's not why we measure five oscillations. Five oscillations reduce the effect of air friction. What? No. C. Five oscillations reduce the uncertainty. Yes. Uncertainty. Remember, uncertainty is like including both random error and systematic error. So five oscillations reduce the uncertainty of the measured period. Yes. Yes. That's that's good. Five oscillations reduce the uncertainty on the measured length. No, rubbish. It's C. Remember, what we normally do in experiment is when we, when we like calculate stuff. So when we're calculating, we're gonna get some different values. So we we will calculate. For example, you know how we do um, what they say here? Five oscillations. Say we do five oscillations and they got five results for p the time. Of course, because they sub in the L and they get times. So let's say they get like I don't know twenty, twenty one, twenty one point three. 19.9 and say 20.5. So if they get five oscillations, what we do is it's always the time. It's always the dependent variable that we use. It's not that we don't actually average out the um, the length and then do we do those calculations. That's useless. We actually just keep those lengths normally and calculate those periods, for example, these two peri these periods, and then we average them out. So be careful of that. So what we average or what we get the five oscillation is to um, reduce the uncertainty for the period, which is your dependent variable. Hope that makes sense. 20. As part of the physics course, Anna, Bianca, Chris and Danny Shrew investigate the physics of a car crash. On an internet site that describes what happens during a car crash, they found the following statement. It happens in a flash. Your car goes from driving to impacting. As the vehicle crashes into something, it stops or slowly very abruptly. And at that point of impact, the car structure will bend or break. They're actually talking here. I believe they're talking about the um, uh, crumbling zone, like the crumble. Um, the, that crumbling action works to absorb some of the initial crash forces, protecting the passenger's compartment to some degree. The students disagree about the use of the word forces in the statement. The crumbling action works to absorb some of the initial crash forces, protecting the passenger's compartment to some degree. Which of the following students best identifies the physics of how the crumbling action protects the passengers? Let's have a look. A. Anna. To absorb some of the initial crash energy. To absorb some of the initial crash energy, protecting... Look, when it... Sorry. To absorb some of the initial crash speed. Speed, sorry. I don't know what am I reading. Um, crash speed? Not really, to be honest. Um, it's not... We don't talk about absorbing 
speed like it, it, it's just here the word here it's important to look at the wording so anna to absorb some of that initial crash speed that's not yeah the word doesn't absorbing speed is really wrong now it, it makes sense that yes it do, it feels like it's absorbing speed but no it's not really doing that b to absorb some of the initial crash kinetic energy okay when we're talking about energy yes we can absorb energy so that looks also good b chris to absorb some of that initial crash momentum yeah we can absorb momentum. Dash to absorb some of the initial crash forces. <laughs> absorbing forces? Not really. Like you, that, that that doesn't even sound great. Like absorbing. We don't normally absorb speed um forces, but we do absorb energy and momentum. So yeah. Just from my mind, these are coming to my mind. B or C could either be right. Because I know for example, all crashing and all that stuff, what they use normally is for momentum and um yeah. So let's also, like, now let's break it down on which one it could be, B or C. Let's think. So the students describe about the use of word forces. The crumbling action protects the passenger by what? Actually, when we're talking about the crumbling action, forces, so energy sounds more better. And here's why. I think energy would sound better than momentum. Here, also, momentum is true. Nah, nah. Momentum is always also right in this case. Um... Let's really think about this. So when, for example, let's say this is a wall and this is a car. And what happens is, so this is, of course, your crumble zone in front of the car. Or it, we also have at the back of the car. So as a car, say it's going at like 100 meters per second. Oh, not 100 meters per second, 100 kilometers per, per hour, pretty much. That's normal speed. So it's going at a high speed and then it crashes to this. Now, what's... Because we have speed here, well, it has a high kinetic energy. It has a high kinetic energy, yeah? So it has a very high kinetic energy. And the problem is, if how do we dissipate some of that energy? Because if all that, and if imagine we didn't have that crumble zone, imagine the car looked like this and it really did crash on it. It would kill the driver quickly. It would just instantly kill him because all the energy would go on that driver. All of that energy would just transfer to the driver and that driver would quickly die. But, um, now, if we have a crumble zone, what that crumble zone does is it, when the car actually crashes, it deforms. And actually, all that, some of the energy, that kinetic energy, it's not all going to be, you know, dissipated. It's going to be, some of it is going to be dissipated to the deformation of the crumble zone. And so, it will take a little bit, some of that energy and deform it, and hence leave some of the energy to the human. So, it wouldn't be as a fatal crash, I would say. Um, that's what my mind's coming from energy, but momentum... It could also be momentum. Because momentum is m times v, where velocity is very important in terms of momentum. And also the mass of the... Look, yeah. So remember, like, kinetic energy is half mv squared. And momentum is equal to mv. Both have v, v, and mass, and mass. So, and both can actually be absorbed. So, <laughs> v and c both sound great. But I would say, I think kinetic energy does describe more of that crumbling. I can't really describe momentum in a way, like how momentum changes. But I can talk about, of course, kinetic energy. Um, it, it's the, for the deformation of the crumbling zone. It takes some of that energy and deforms it and hence leaves a little bit of energy to the human. So he doesn't get a, he doesn't fatally die. Yeah. Um, all right. I think, look, if I was guessing, I'd say B, but. I'll be honest with you, I do have to check my answer for this one. This one's quite confusing. I think C is also correct. So I will put a question mark on this one here. I think, yeah, I do believe also C is right when they're talking about momentum. Yeah, I really need to check that one. Um, yeah, if, if anyone has an actual good explanation for this, please send it through the comments because I'll be honest with you, this one's quite actually eating my head in, yeah. Because I believe B and C both describe it in a good way. But I think B is more easy to, like, when we're talking about, of course, energy transformations, um, kinetic energy is one of the best ways. Yeah, I'll say B. Yeah, I hope you guys learned something through this video and take something out of it. Please make sure to like and subscribe and share this video with your friends and your peers. I hope you guys have a great day and take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.